Thank you for joining today for this class on promoting pollinators in your river friendly yard. This class is brought to you by One Truckee River with funding from the Truckee River Fund. My name is Carrie Jensen. I'm a landscape architect and environmental educator, and I'm here today representing One Truckee River. One Truckee River is a nonprofit in the Reno Sparks area that works with lots of different organizations, nonprofits, as well as public agencies to protect the Truckee River. Our mission is to ensure a healthy, thriving, sustainable river connected to the hearts and minds of its community. There is a management plan that One Truckee River is working to implement with all of these partners that was ratified by the cities of Reno and Sparks and Washoe County in 2016. And there are lots of different objectives and goals as part of that plan, but don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all of them today. I'm just gonna touch on a few. The first is to make sure that we're delivering the cleanest water possible into our storm drain system. The second is to promote biodiversity throughout our watershed and wildlife habitat. And the third is to foster a culture of stewardship where we're all working together in our community to help protect the Truckee River. And we're meeting those three objectives with our new program called River Friendly Yards. And I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of that program. There are six major principles that we're trying to promote for homeowners to consider in their yards. The first is to keep water on site. The second is to reduce the pollutants that we could potentially send out to the river. The third is to use water wisely. The fourth principle is to build healthy soils, the foundation of any healthy yard. And the fifth is to create wildlife habitat. That's what we're going to be really concentrating on in this presentation today. And the sixth is to prepare for wildfire, as wildfire can have large impacts on water quality in a watershed. And so today, the topic we're really diving into is promoting pollinators and creating that wildlife habitat in our river-friendly yards. So I thought I'd start out with, what is a pollinator? Just to make sure everybody's on the same page with that big question. So in basic uh, standards, a Pollinator is anything that takes pollen from the stamen, the male part of the flower, into the inside the pistil, the female part of the flower. And the pollinators that most people are familiar with are honeybees, as shown here. They're probably the ones everybody thinks of when they think of pollinators. So there are lots of other kinds of pollinators, including lots of native bees, and there are many to choose from. And we're not going to learn about all of them today, but just as a fun fact, if you live in the Great Basin here, um, the Great Basin is home to about a quarter of all native bee species in the United States. So if you love bees and you live in the Great Basin, you're in the right place because we have a lot of them to learn about. Uh, flies can also be pollinators like this hoverfly, and some of the times they even mimic bees with their coloration. The, the difference is that they have just one wing on each side, you can see here whereas bees have two. Sometimes they're fused and it's hard to tell, but two is a bee and one is a fly. Uh, beetles and other insects can also be pollinators, as well as moths and butterflies. And even birds like hummingbirds can pollinate. And there's even um, some mammals like bats. The lesser long-nosed bat in the uh, deserts of the Southwest pollinates plants like the saguaro cactus. So now that we know what a pollinator is, let's learn about why are they important. And before we dive into the pollinators, I like to talk about insects in general. So insect populations are the bottom of our food chains and support many species above them. Um, and that includes birds. So a lot of people don't think about it, but baby birds really need insects for their diet. They need a high protein diet so they can grow quickly and fledge out of the nest. They don't eat things like seeds and fruit, they eat bugs. So we need all of those insects to uh, support our bird populations and all the other things too. So I'm gonna launch a poll here, get you guys thinking. So we have a question. How many caterpillars are needed to feed a clutch of chickadees? This should pop up on your guys' screen. Just click the answer you think. How many caterpillars are needed to feed a clutch of chickadees? 
Okay, looks like we've got most people. 100, 500, 2,000, or 5,000. I'm going to share the results there so you guys can see it. So it looks like the majority of people thought about 2,000, next 500. And the answer is actually 5,000 or more. So surprisingly, it takes a mama bird on an awful lot of trips going to find insects to feed her babies to get them out of the nest. 5,000 or more. There was a study the University of Delaware did where they tracked uh, Carolina chickadees and estimated how many caterpillars it took. Pollinators also pollinate 90% of flowering plants on earth. So that's pretty important why we need them. And that also translates to about 75% of the crops that we depend upon. And another way to think about that is that one in three bites that you eat uh, requires a pollinator. So a lot of our staples like wheat and corn are wind pollinated, might not necessarily need a pollinator. But if you want things like strawberries and watermelons, you need pollinators for those. So we would have a very boring diet without them. And you might have heard that pollinators are in decline. It's been throughout the news lately on the fronts of major publications. Uh, throughout the world, there's a global concern from entomologists or bug scientists that there's a decline in insect populations being seen. One of the populations you've probably heard the most about is the monarch butterfly. And that's because it is a pretty special butterfly in that it migrates and there's a population that migrates and overwinters on the west coast or the Pacific coast of the United States. And we see them migrate through our area here in the Reno Sparks, Truckee Meadows area. And every year the Xerce Society goes out and does a Thanksgiving count where they go to the overwintering sites and estimate how many monarch butterflies have returned to their locations for the winter. And this is their data. And I just wanna kind of walk you through it. It's a lot of stuff. So the first are the green bars that are going up and down. And if you just look following that red arrow, starting in 1997, the first time they surveyed, they found over a million butterflies. And that goes all the way down to 2020 last year. The really sad thing is that there were, uh, they counted less than 2000. So the population has declined pretty dramatically. The good news is that this last year in 2021, they actually saw a rebound in the population slightly. So it's dire, but it's not over yet. <laughs> and then the blue lines, um, what those represent is the number of sites that they have monitored. So despite the fact that they've actually been monitoring more sites over time, they've still seen a large decline. And what we can take from all of this data is that the Western monarch butterfly populations have greatly declined over the past 25 years. So there's great concern for that species. And it's not just the monarch that have been monitored. There's a really great story, some local scientists who have been studying monarch or butterfly populations for a long time. So this is Art Shapiro from UC Davis Department of Evolution and Ecology. And he's one of my heroes because he's done an awful lot of work in this uh, area. So he has 10 monitoring sites that are on a transect kind of looking at populations down in the Central Valley of California and also populations of butterflies up in the high Sierras up in the mountains. So looking at different elevations and populations of butterflies across that whole transect of elevational data. And he started monitoring those sites back in 1972 and miraculously continuously did it every single year for over 30 years. So ARTS project uh, for butterfly monitoring is the longest continual running butterfly monitoring project in the world, which is pretty cool because it's right here in our backyard. And today, it, the data collection is being continued in collaboration with the University of Nevada, Reno, the Great Basin Bug Lab. Matt Forrester there on the left uh, runs that program. And they monitor the sites up in the Sierras now. So that data is continuously being collected. And one of those sites is at Castle Peak, right above Donner Lake. And at this site, they have found declines in the population since 2011. So this global concern of insect decline is being seen locally as well. 
And because most people think of butterflies and bees when they think of pollinators, I also just like to bring up some other mayflies um, or macroinvertebrates are some of my favorite insects. They're not specifically pollinators, but they are very important to aquatic ecosystems like rivers, like the Truckee River that I help teach about. And they live in the water as nymphs, as shown here on the left. And then when they hatch out as adults, uh, they look like this on the right. And they're so important for supporting fish populations. They're a major food source for our rivers. So if we want to keep fish happy in our, our rivers and lakes, we have to keep uh, macroinvertebrates at the bottom of the food chain. And studies have also found declines in these species. Uh, there was a major study in the upper Mississippi Lake Erie watershed where they found declines of up to 50% um, for this species since 2012. So in a rather short period of time to have about half of the population decline is pretty shocking. So you might be asking now like, oh, that's all very sad news, but why is it happening? There are many different reasons, but one of the major ones scientists are looking at is uh, climate change. Insect populations are really dependent upon temperature and precipitation patterns for their life cycles, and those have been changing on a pretty rapid ecological scale. Invasive species encroachment may be another impact. Uh, here in the Great Basin, we have lots of areas that have been taken over by cheatgrass, which is this reddish uh, grass in between here. And that takes up habitat that would otherwise be utilized by native plants and native insect populations. Habitat destruction is another thing that is probably affecting insect populations across the United States. We have typically over the last half century been using a model of suburban development, and we are still developing suburban um, housing developments at a rate of about 2 million acres per year. And that's a really big number, help you kind of visualize how much is that. That's about the size of Yellowstone National Park every year. So that's an awful lot of habitat that is being taken away for insect populations and wildlife in general. And when these areas are developed, they have a lot of infrastructure shown in this picture with impermeable surfaces and uh, that don't allow water to flow through, which we'll talk about later. But there's also have yards that are usually pretty dominated by lawn. And when we think about this, we'll talk more about it, but just to visualize how much lawn we now have in the United States, it's estimated it's about 40 million acres. And a way to kind of visualize that is it's more than half the state of Nevada. So if you think about Nevada, it's a pretty wide state. You can drive almost eight hours across it. So if we put sod grass down for all the way from the border with Idaho, it would go to about Tonopah. So that's how much grass we have planted in the United States. Another factor affecting insect populations, pesticides. There's been a lot of regulation um, associated with pesticides since the 1960s when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, but it's still used as a, a pest management practice and it can affect um, native populations of insects, not necessarily just the ones that are being targeted. So that's kind of the end of my doom and gloom. <laughs> and I just want to kind of end it with uh, this uplifting quote that I have from Matt Forrester here at UNR. He said that insects, like every bit of the natural world, are declining, but it's clear insects have the possibility to rebound. It's grim, but it's not too late. And that's where you all come in. So that's why we're going to talk about what you can do. How can we all help pollinators in our own yards and make sure that we are supporting those populations. There are two major solutions that we can look at, and the first is creating habitat. We basically want to set out the welcome mat for the pollinators and provide them with food, water, and shelter. So we're going to go through those three things. The first is food. And you guys, we talked about lawns in the United States. Look at this picture of this typical suburban development. This is in the North Valleys of uh, Reno Sparks area somewhere, but it could really be anywhere USA, right? And when you look at it, that lawn and foundation shrubs that we are all really used to, it's kind of like a food desert for insects. There's not a whole lot of resources there, no pollen and nectar to be found. So one of the ways we can help with that is to bring in diversity of plants. 
mix it up and bring in more so that there are more resources for insects. And we bring in those plants, you can also think about clustering them. I call this the bee buffet effect, uh, though you can think about it as insects are tiny and they have to take a lot of energy to fly from plant to plant to plant, right? So if you put them all together in one group, especially one type of plant in a large cluster, it's a bee buffet. They can just go from one flower to the next to the next and fill up their plate and not expend as much energy. Whereas if you plant like one plant over here and another over there, they have to fly that long distance and it takes up a lot of energy. So you can help pollinators by clustering your pollinator plants in one area. We also wanna think about planting plants that flower throughout the entire growing season. So you always want something blooming in your yard. You don't want it to just look beautiful at one time. This goes for aesthetics for us too. It's nice to have something blooming all the time. And it also provides resources for insects throughout the year if you always have something blooming. So I'm gonna take you through some quick examples of what that could look like. You can take notes if you'd like. Don't worry about memorizing every single plant. It's just to kind of give you an idea of thinking about this seasonal effect. So in the spring, you're gonna start out with things like fruit trees. Fruit trees usually bloom pretty early in the spring, provide resources. And then there's other plants like phlox that are e easily grown in our gardens and are early bloomers. There's also lots of wildflowers that you can plant. This one is lupin. There's also lots of different types of penstemons that you can think about. Uh, the one on the right here is called the firecracker penstemon. And I like to include this one and any plant really that has these long red tubes those particularly attract hummingbirds. So if you want a hummingbird garden, try to do everything with these long tubular red flowers and you'll find lots of hummingbirds come to your yard. Um, there's also other penstemons like this Rocky Mountain penstemon here on the left, which ironically, I have a picture of a bumblebee on, um, but often bumblebees are actually too big to get into these flowers. So I've seen them actually go to the back and they will nip a little hole and suck the nectar out of the back of the flower, thus bypassing the pollen. So they're not actually great pollinators in this instance, um, but it does provide resources for them. And smaller other native bees like the blue orchard bee gets in there just fine. So these are great for pollinators providing resources. As we move into the summer months, we can include things like this one on the left is bee plant. These are annual or no, annual and perennial wildflowers. Yarrow is on the right. That's a really common one. It's really easy for gardens and blooms um, throughout the summertime. Milkweeds, we'll talk about those more, are specifically great for monarchs. And any kind of sage, there's the Russian sage here on the right, clary sage on the left, and there's so many different sages. You can think about any of those as great for pollinators. Some other examples in the summer uh, on the right here are um, evening primrose. That's great for moths because it opens in the evening. And then on the left here, we have buckwheat. There are lots of different types of buckwheats. Those are all great. Lavender is another typical one in the garden for pollinators in the summer. And anything in the sunflower family. So. It could be just your typical sunflower. It could be things like um, blanket flower, echinacea, daisies. There are so many in the sunflower family. They're all great choices. Then as we move into the fall, you can think about things like globe mallow or desert globe mallow shown here on the left and hummingbird fuchsia on the right. Once again, those trumpet flowers. And in the fall, things like goldenrod, and asters are also great for later blooming. And even though people probably don't wanna hear it, I'm gonna mention rabbit brush because even though a lot of people are allergic to it, it is absolutely great for pollinators and it's a very late bloomer. So it'll bloom like Halloween to Thanksgiving in that period where you're really trying to extend into the winter months. So even if you don't love it, maybe plant one, um, it can help provide that seasonal extension into the winter for pollinators. You might have noticed I mentioned a lot of native and non-native plants. So you might be like thinking, hmm, which is better? Which should I use? Does it matter? 
And my advice would be native is always going to be better because populations of insects have evolved with native plants. So they're probably gonna provide better resources. However, there are non-native plants that still provide nectar and pollen. What I advise people to do though, is that when you look at a non-native plant, I want you to put on your bee vision and go in there and look at the flower. <laughs> and the example here is the rose. So if you guys put on your bee goggles and look, which rose do you think provides better nectar and pollen for a bee? Should be pretty obvious, right? The one on the right, you guys can see the nectar and pollen with that bee vision on. <laughs> Whereas our traditional hybridized rose that everybody loves, we have uh, developed those roses to have particular characteristics that we love, like those big full petals and nice scent but they've gotten so crazy that the bees can't get in there very easily. So whenever you are looking at a non-native plant, just try to use that bee vision and think about, does this provide resources? And they're usually less hybridized plants that are going to do that. So more of your old fashioned or grandmother's favorite kind of varieties that haven't been hybridized too far. And that we've talked a lot about feeding the adults, the nectar and pollen provided throughout the garden and throughout the season. We also need to think about feeding the larvae. So it's the chicken and the egg, right? You can't have like an adult butterfly without first having a caterpillar. And they require different food sources than the adults. I'm sure you guys have all experienced a child in your life who goes through a phase who will only eat macaroni and cheese. And I use this example because caterpillars are not very different. Just like our children, they're very picky eaters. Um, many of them have adapted to eat only one type of plant. And kind of the classic example is the monarch shown here. This is their caterpillar and they only eat milkweed. And that's because they've evolved over thousands and thousands and thousands of years to have this special relationship with milkweed. They eat this plant, which is toxic, it incorporates that toxicity into their bodies. They're immune, but it makes them toxic to other things so they don't get eaten, which is why they're the bright colors that they are. It's the kind of warning, warning, hello, I'm poisonous, guys. That also means that the caterpillar, this caterpillar can't just change to a different food source. It's, it's not like a fad diet. They've evolved over all this time to eat this specific plant. And a lot of butterfly or caterpillar populations have specific relationships with these a specific native plant and they can't change to others. Another example, uh, the bear's hair streak here on the left, their host plant for their caterpillars are bitter brush. So I try to encourage people to include native plants in their garden because they're more likely to provide what I call caterpillar munch um, or, or mac and cheese for the caterpillars. So some examples of that would be like wild rose, uh, red twig dogwood, thimbleberry, uh, desert peach, great host for caterpillars, even though it's thorny, I know. Uh, mountain mahogany is another one. I even showed an example here. It's got some caterpillar munch on there. And choke cherry. And even sagebrush be a host plant for caterpillars and lots of other insects. You might not want a whole yard of it, I admit, but just want to get people thinking about the diversity of native plants you could include. And when, next we can talk about sourcing these plants. So now that you kind of have an idea of what you might be looking for, you're gonna to go to a nursery and try to find these plants. And before we do that, we have to talk about neonicotinoids. Um, this is because this is a class of pesticides that are systemic. So they are, um, applied and then it gets sucked up into the plant and becomes part of the plant tissue. It's, it works great as an insecticide because then the plants don't, um, if anything eats them, it affects them. So it protects the plant really well. But the unfortunate thing is that their side effects may not just be like the one insect you didn't want to touch your plant, but bumblebees or honeybees or anything else that comes and takes pollen from that plant also ingests that insecticide. So when you buy a plant from a nursery, you need to make sure it has not been treated with one of these chemicals, these neonics or neonicotinoids, because then if you plant it in your garden, it's not gonna provide for your pollinators very well because it's spreading insecticide into their populations. 
The only way to know for sure that a plant does not have a neonicotinoid on it is to buy USDA organic. That's the only labeling system we currently have in the US. Unfortunately, it's not commonly used for just nursery plants. If you go and buy like veggie starts, you can probably find a organic label, but just for a common garden plant, it's hard to find this labeling system. Especially if you go to just a generic big box store, you walk in and ask like, has this been treated with neonicotinoids? Probably the person who works there is gonna have no idea where the plants were sourced from. So because we don't have a great labeling system, what I recommend is trying to go to local nurseries as much as possible, because the smaller they are and the more localized they are, the more likely they're gonna know where their plant material came from and if it was treated with any chemicals. Uh, so I have uh, examples of some locals to choose from. Uh, this is not an endorsement of any particular one and it may not be exclusive, but I just wanted to give you an idea. There are lots of local nurseries to uh, choose from. It doesn't just have to be your big box store. Oh, and when you go into those nurseries, always ask about neonicotinoids. The more we ask, the more nurseries are going to be aware and start to think about labeling and where they're getting their plants from. You can also grow from seed if you're really concerned. Sometimes seeds are treated with neonicotinoids, um, especially big commercial, but you guys aren't planting like soy or corn crops in your yard. Um, if you're just sourcing wildflowers, those probably have not been treated with any kind of chemical. And a good local source is um, Comstock Seed. They, like I said, I'm not endorsing any particular one, but trying to give you guys resources. They're kind of the biggest one in our area where you can find a wide variety of native wildflower seeds. So we talked a lot about food. Next, we'll quickly talk about water. So insects need water just like we do. And the thing is they don't wanna get their wings wet when they are drinking. So it's best to put out a shallow bowl for them. And it's really easy to do. You just put out a flower pot dish, put some pebbles in it and make sure that there's landing spots for them. You do wanna make sure you clean these out so we don't create mosquito breeding habitat. But from my experience in the Truckee Meadows, it evaporates so quickly, it's hard to even keep the bowl full. Um, but if you do have a deeper and uh, one, do make sure you dump it out at least every week so that it doesn't create mosquito habitat. So food, water, and the last one is shelter. One of the ways we can provide shelter for overwintering habitat for insects is to leave some leaves in our yard. And I do say this with a little bit of caution because we do live in a high fire danger um, area in the Western United States. So we don't wanna leave all our leaves, especially not around the um, immediate five foot periphery of our foundations of our homes, but in some further areas as mulch underneath some shrubs and stuff, leaving a little bit of leaves in the winter time can provide really great overwintering habitat for insects. So we don't need to tidy up and clean our entire yard, just be uh, cognizant of trying to do it in strategic places. We can also embrace dormant plants. These can provide habitat as well as food resources for wildlife in the winter time. There are lots of native bees that use um, cavities of reeds for nesting. And there's also things like um, birds that need resources in the winter. So leaving out seeds and dead, dead flower heads throughout the winter can provide seasonal visual interest for us and also resources for all kinds of wildlife. Rock walls can also provide overwintering um, cracks and crannies for insects to overwinter in. And a lot of native bees are ground nesters, solitary ground nesters. So when most people think about bees, they think of hives of honeybees, but the majority of bees are actually solitary and they just dig a burrow for that one single bee in the dirt. So it's really important to leave some places in your yard bare so they're not covered with mulch so that they can dig those nests. So leaving a little bit of bare soil in some areas can be really beneficial for those solitary uh, native bees. There's also cavity nesting bees. And you've probably seen uh, these guys to provide habitat for them for nesting boxes, also called bee hotels. And I like to encourage people to think about them more as bee motels instead of hotels. And this is all about size. 
because if we've learned anything in the last couple of years, we know that large congregations of people in one place can spread disease very quickly. The same is true for bee populations. So we need to make sure that we don't make these too large so that we're helping make sure the bees don't congregate too many in one place and spread disease quickly. So think bee motel, not bee hotel. <laughs> uh, and when you build these guys, um, do make sure that the tubes are at least six inches long. And this is because bees have adapted to lay female eggs in the back and male eggs in the front. And if the tubes aren't long enough, they will only lay male eggs. So then in the spring, you'll get a disproportionate um, population. So these can look really cool, but you do need to do the research to make sure you're building what actually works for the species you're trying to attract. You also need to clean them once a year. So the easiest way to do this is in the springtime, like late March, early April, take all the materials out, put it in a safe part of your yard so that then when the bees emerge, they come out and you can then discard those materials and put new ones into your box so that there's always fresh nesting materials and there's no disease or mites or things left in there. Thinking about the location of our pollinator gardens next. There are some general rules. So if you're gonna put in a pollinator garden, one of the things to consider is to try to put it in a place where it gets morning sunshine. And this is because the insects need that warmth from the sun to help get them invigorated and going in the day. So if it's in a sunny spot, they will get out and foraging earlier before it gets windy, which <laughs> speaking of wind is another thing to consider for a pollinator garden. Because when it's really windy, you can just think about if you're this bee trying to approach this flower, if the flower is moving all over the place, it's going to expend more energy to get its resources. So if we can put our pollinator gardens in a place that's protected from the wind, to the extent that it's possible in Northern Nevada, that would be beneficial, but not an absolute requirement. And we talked a little bit about lawns in the beginning. So this is a great opportunity for a location for a pollinator garden is to take up some of that lawn space for pollinators. And I really try to encourage people to think about this as not having to remove their entire lawn because they can be fun places to play in, but strategically thinking about how you can remove some of it to provide pollinator habitat. And I really try to encourage, these are what I call buffer strips where your um, pollinator plants are put in between the lawn and the sidewalk. And this is why I think that's important because if this was an actual classroom and have you guys raise your hands, have you seen this scenario? <laughs> yes, I'm sure you have. <laughs> Whereas the sidewalk is being watered by the sprinklers. So here comes my next poll question for you guys. I'll launch this. Where does the storm drain flow to? So that water that flows on the sidewalk then goes down these drains. Where, does, where do those drains go? Does it go to the sewer treatment plant? Does it go to local waterways? Or I have no clue. All right, we'll share the results there. Looks like you guys are well informed. Yes, all those drains go to a local waterway, at least in the Truckee Meadows. Um, in our area, this system is separate from the sewer system and all of the drains on the street go out to our local waterways and eventually the Truckee River and they are not cleaned or treated. So any of the stuff that flows down those drains ends up in the river. So just to kind of show this system. So you think about the sanitary sewer, which a lot of people get confused between the sewer and the storm drain. So the sewer system, when you flush the toilet or put something down your sink, that goes into pipes that go under the ground. They go out eventually to a treatment plant. And in our area, the predominant one is out in East Sparks, where the water is then cleaned before it's discharged into the river. On the other hand, the storm drain system is completely separate from that. All of those drains on the side of our streets that take the water so it doesn't flood, those go out, they go down into pipes too that are under the ground, but they eventually flow out to our local waterways 
which all eventually flow to the Truckee River if you live in the Truckee River watershed. And if we use chemicals like uh, synthetic fertilizers that contain nitrogen and phosphorus in our yards, which I know most people do, it can become a problem, especially if we have those lawns right next to the sidewalks or the street. When the sprinklers come on, if those fertilizers have not been used, they can easily dissolve into the water and then flow down the drain. And when they reach local waterways, they cause algae blooms, which are really detrimental to aquatic ecosystems. Basically, the algae goes crazy. They grow really fast. And when they start to decompose, they suck oxygen out of the water, which can cause fish die off, as well as die off of other species like the mayfly that we talked about earlier. So responsible use of fertilizers becomes very important. We'll talk more about that later. But one of the ways we can avoid this issue is by putting a pollinator garden in between our lawn and the sidewalk so we have less potential for this, um, these fertilizers that we use on our lawn to ever flow out and get into the drain. So these pollinator gardens in the buffer strip, they keep water on site, they reduce pollutants, they use water more wisely, and they create wildlife habitat. So they are very river friendly. And that's where I try to encourage people, if you don't know where to put your pollinator garden, think about this spot first. When we talk about pollinator gardens, you might think, how big does it have to be? I often get that question, what size should it be? And my answer to that is any size you have available. Even if you just live in an apartment or just have a patio deck, you don't have a lot of space, a pot with some pollinator plants in it can be a pollinator garden. So start with whatever you have. And the real important thing here is to think not the size of an individual garden, but the size of our collective gardens. So if we're all working together to put in a little bit here and there across an entire community, we can create an awful lot of habitat. So we talked about how to create habitat. That was our first solution. Our second solution is now to think about how to reduce chemicals. The first one I'm gonna talk about is nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's because of my friends here, the mayflies. We talked about algae blooms and how those can affect them. So one of the ways we can reduce the amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus that go out are pretty easy. Like when we wash our car, instead of washing it in the driveway, with soaps that contain phosphates, we can take it to the car wash. When we wash our cars at the commercial car wash, those drains actually go to the sewer treatment plant. So that reduces that potential for our phosphorus to go out. Also using fertilizers responsibly, like we talked about moving those lawns away and just making sure that we follow the instructions for fertilizers. More is not always necessarily better. So we wanna put down the right amount for our plants so that we don't have that potential for excess to flow away. We can also think about improving our soils. Healthy soils create healthy plants. And one of the key ways to do this is by incorporating compost into our soils. We can also try strategies like um, this where it's called grass cycling, where when you mow your lawn, you take the bag off and you more, mow more frequently so that the small clippings fall in place and compost in place adding more organic matter into our soils so that we don't have to apply as much fertilizer. We also wanna reduce this runoff. Obviously we talked about why that is detrimental. One of the ways we can think about that is by following our local water authorities watering recommendations. And most people think of the, do I water on an even or odd day? The other part I like to emphasize is that you should not water if you look in the bottom right there, when it is windy, <laughs> which is very common in our area. So really try to water in the mornings before it gets windy. That can be really helpful. Also hiring quell or qualified water efficient landscapers, they can come out and do water audits, which is what this picture is showing where they're looking at your irrigation system and adjusting it for efficiency to make sure it's working at its top notch um, to conserve water and also to reduce any potential for runoff as well. And of course, we wanna reduce pesticides to help protect our pollinators in our yard. Once again, throwing in some humor here. If we build all this nice habitat, it doesn't work very well for the bees and butterflies if you put on the poor seasoning afterwards. <laughs> 
So we really want to concentrate on after we build the habitat, making sure we don't use pesticides. And I have another poll question for you guys. Should pop up here. Who do you think uses more pesticides, farmers or homeowners? Okay, and that guy, pop it up so you guys can see. So it looks like the vast majority of you think it's homeowners and science has shown that that may be true. Um, it, it, it's hard to say across the board, right? But there have been studies that have been done in urban areas where they've looked at pesticide concentrations in urban creeks versus adjacent um, agricultural areas and actually found higher pesticide content in the urban creek next to homes than they found in the agricultural stream next to a farm. So it is suggested that perhaps homeowners are using more. And this might be because there's economic incentive for farmers in that pesticides are very expensive, especially when you're applying them across a large area. So they don't wanna spend more money than they have to. And they thus are probably only applying the amount that they need. Whereas homeowners might take more of a laissez-faire approach and apply more is better <laughs> kind of thing. So that's where that uh, thought is. And we can reduce our pesticide usage because the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is pesticides are often called, they're broad spectrum in that they don't affect just the species you're trying to get rid of, like a cockroach, for example. They can also affect beneficial insect populations like butterflies and bees and all kinds of things in your yard that maybe you didn't intend to affect. So we encourage people to use this program called Integrated Pest Management. And it's kind of a mouthful but it's a pyramid here where you're trying to use the things on the bottom and then work your way up. So these are different tools in the toolbox to try. And the chemical, the important thing to remember, the chemical is the last resort. So we try all the other things before we ever reach for a bottle of pesticide when we're trying to control a pest. So prevention uh, is worth it. Oh, I'm gonna forget the, the phrase, but you guys know it. Prevention is important. <laughs> As one of the ways we can prevent like weeds is to mulch our soils to make sure that um, we're suppressing any weeds from coming up, basically shade them out. If we have covered soils, we have less germination of weeds. You can also use this method called sheet mulching where you put down cardboard newspaper and then you put wood mulch on top of it. This really shades out, it basically works as an organic weed fabric and makes it so that the weeds can't germinate up through it. And then you just replenish this um, a couple of times, like every few years. And I kind of call this like lasagna composting. You're building layers of lasagna and you suppress the weeds at the same time. So after you've done all the prevention you can, the next step up is to look at cultural practices, like installing plants that are adapted to our area so that you don't need to, um, or they're going to be less susceptible to pests and disease to begin with, because they're already adapted to the local climate. Also using appropriate irrigation, making sure the plants are getting the right amount of water. A healthy plant is less susceptible to pests. Once again, using those qualified water efficient landscapers to help you if you need help with your irrigation. Next tier up for integrated pest management is to look at physical controls. And for weeding, an unfortunate thing means pulling weeds. If you've got a small area though, this can be very satisfying, I think, it's sort of meditative. So don't think about weed pulling as necessarily a chore as a fun activity. There's also um, physical traps you can use in your garden. I love to show this one. So this is an earwig trap. So it's just a little cup. It could be like a yogurt cup or something. You put a little water in the bottom, some oil, and it's some drops of soy sauce. Don't know why, but earwigs are attracted to soy sauce. So this is an actual study at Colorado State University. They put these traps out in agricultural areas. This one cup caught over 500 earwigs in one night. So they're very effective. I have also found them to be effective against box elder bugs. So if you have those in your yard, this can work for them too. Next up the tier is biological controls. This is where you use one species to try to control another 
The kind of classic example people think of are um, ladybugs eating aphids. So this is a ladybug larva eating aphids. And while some people release these guys into their yard, you can do that if you want, but I kind of personally think it's better just to build it and they will come. So if you build a diverse habitat that encourages lots of different insects, then they're gonna to tend to help control each other. And there's another predator in the garden you might get, the praying mantis. And then the last step up on pest degraded, integrated pest management is chemical control. And if you use any kind of pesticide, you are legally required to read all the fine print and follow the instructions for application. I do wanna kind of bring to attention a few um, just general products. So there are common products called weed and feed for your lawns. And um, I'm not looking at any specific brands, but just this class of a pesticide and fertilizer combo. The pesticides contained in those are often toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates, and they should not be applied near storm drains. So like on your lawn where it could wash off down the storm drain. Um, and they can also contaminate groundwater. So think about those guys. And the other kind of broad class to think about are those two-in-one, um, like pesticide and feed, like rose two-in-one kind of weed and feed uh, products where you put on uh, perennials. Those contain neonicotinoids. The, that's what they're, the two-in-one is a fertilizer and usually a neonicotinoid that is absorbed up into the plant. So if you wanna protect pollinators, try to avoid those products in general too. And the EPA now has a special pesticide labeling um, that's specific to protecting pollinators. So if you look on a pesticide label that has this little symbol, it's gonna have special instructions for application to protect pollinators. And with that, I just kind of wanna leave you guys with some inspiration to maybe accept a few more dandelions in your lives and embrace nature so that we work with it instead of against it so that we can all have this wish for the future where we have biodiversity and support this beautiful place where we live. With that, uh, my overview of promoting pollinators in your river-friendly yard. The two things you need to remember is to create habitat, which is a food, water, and shelter, and then to reduce your chemicals, both the synthetic fertilizers and the pesticides. And reaching back to that one Truckee River management plan goals, make sure we covered those. At the end of this, you should have a better idea of how to ensure that we're delivering the cleanest water possible into our storm drain system, how to support wildlife throughout our watershed, and also foster a culture of stewardship where we're all working together to help protect the Truckee River. And you guys have homework. <laughs> so my call to action to everybody is that I want you to tell one person about something you learned from this class. Help me spread the word. Because the power of all working together is that I can't do it alone. I need all of you to help me spread the word and make sure that we're all working together as a community.